night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of war. His voice to me is calling, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever Oh, Father, how sweet it is to walk with you. Father, we thank you that we can awaken in the morning, and, Father, we can spend time with you, open your word, and talk to you in prayer. And, Father, we know that you hear us, that you love us, that you care about us, even the most intricate details of our life. Father, things that others might find trivial, you find important. We love you, Father. and We want to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Father. Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you for this church. Father, I thank you for this fellowship that we can get together and knowing that we're going to journey through this walk together, that we'll love each other, we'll support each other, that we'll look forward to seeing each other. And Father, we just turn all this over into your hands. It's in the name of Jesus we trust. Amen. All right. Well, it is good to see everybody this evening. And so... We are jumping straight to our missionary, and so this is our missionary for the week, and this is Brandon and Anne Marie Langley, and they are in St. Rose, uh, Louisiana, and so they, I don't know, does anybody know where St. Rose is? Is that near New Orleans? I don't know. I'm, I have family all over Louisiana. I don't know where St. Rose is, but God would continue to raise up faithful elders, deacons, and church members. Don't be scared of that word. Elder is the same thing as a pastor, okay? That's what that is. So faithful elders, deacons, and church members from the harvest in St. Rose, pray God would help us steward opportunities to plant churches both locally and globally by his grace and for his glory. So a young couple, uh, I don't know where St. Rose is, but I bet you anything it's close to New Orleans. Is it just, yep, there we go. I figured it would be. So, as always, uh, we pray for a North American mission, uh, mission board missionary or church planner every week. And we lift them up because they're out there doing work. And we support them with our gifts. So, I tell you all this all the time. I want to remind you again, whenever we give to our church, part of our budget goes to the cooperative program, which is, a, is a thousands of Southern Baptist churches collect money together to put missionaries on the mission field internationally and nationally, along with supporting our seminaries to train missionaries and pastors. But uh, we support these people. We fund them so they can be on the field, and they don't have to come home and ask for money. They don't have to come home and go to churches and say, please help us stay out there. We support them knowing that they're doing that work. And so um, just this week, uh, I was able to take a, a check for cooperative program giving. Our church last year had a great financial year. And so we underspent the budget and overgave the budget, which is a great thing. So uh, our finance committee made the decision to just write a check of 10% of what we had over uh, that we uh, that we had left over from the year. And so we were able to give a substantial amount of money to the cooperative program. And so I want to thank you for being faithful to God's call on our life and to be part of the cooperative program. And uh, that's what makes us Southern Baptist. We can be Baptist all day long by the way that we believe. But being in, in uh, cooperative relationships with other churches to send missionaries is what makes us Southern Baptist. So this is some of not just the Southern Baptist missionaries or the North American Mission Board missionaries. These are your missionaries. 
They're my missionaries. That's why we pray for these people. So we're going to take time. I'm just going to stand up here and wait for somebody to stand up and pray for them, as we always do. And when you feel led, when somebody feels led, just stand up and pray for Brandon and Anne-Marie Langley. Just a tip. You can pronounce their names this week, and you don't have to guess. So it's a good week <laughs> to be the one that prays. All right. Tonight, before we jump into our text today, which is making decisions versus making disciples while raised hands in the sinner's prayer don't necessarily indicate salvation. That's what we're going to be talking about. It's chapter 9, if you have the book. Um, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 14, if you have your Bible. That's where we're going to be in the text. But before we jump into there, I want to talk to you for just a moment uh, because I've gotten a question uh, multiple times, and I know one of our other church members has answered this question this week, and so I just prepared a basically three to five minute history lesson about the Lenten season or the season of Lent, because a lot of people go, wait, wait, why, what, 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 okay, so why don't we do this, or why do they do this, or is it right, or is it wrong, all those things. So we're going to talk about real quick, and I'm going to give you the background behind it, okay? Uh, Council of Nicaea happens in 325, AD 325, so 300 years after Christ is when the Council of Nicaea meets, and right after that, they set aside 40 days of remembrance for the crucifixion of Jesus. That's what it is. So if you count backwards from Easter Sunday morning, 40 days, you get here. Well, actually, you don't. You actually get 47 days. Now, why is that? Well, because during the time of the Roman Catholic Church having so much power, they said, listen, believers are already doing this on days of mass. And they took that as Sunday. So they said they're already doing it on Sunday. So we have to deduct seven days. So it's actually 47 days because you have 40 days that you were required to, to give up something to have spiritual growth because you were already doing it seven days already during that time period. So if you count from Easter till uh, today, which is Ash Wednesday, it's 47 days. And it's 40 days, but you're already supposed to be doing it seven. Now, when you think about what they are asking you to do, there's a lot of good things that can come from uh, that thought process. Hey, I need to repent of sin and think about what my life cost when it comes to Christ's sacrifice, and that's what it is. The other side of that coin is, is that we only supposed to do that for 40 days. Or should it be a year-round thought process? So that's why Baptists traditionally have not celebrated Lent. And it's more of our liturgical or orthodox brothers and sisters, which is um, Lutheran, Roman Catholic, uh, Anglican, uh, Greek Orthodox, uh, some Methodist, all those. Those are all what we would call liturgical, uh, the dirt, liturgical denominations. And so they celebrate Lent. Now, the problem that we've run into now is what the world always takes, something that is meant for good. I really believe that it was set in place to be, hey, we need to focus on this. And if we haven't spent time focusing on our sin and repenting of our sin, this is what we need to do. And we're going to do it for 40 days, which was the 40 days that Jesus was tempted. That was what the connection is. He was tempted in the wilderness. So that's what they set it aside for. But just like Christmas has now become about Santa Claus and Easter about an Easter Bunny and St. Patrick's Day about alcohol, the world can always take something and make it into what they want. And that's what's happened. And so if you know the history behind Mardi Gras, which is a celebration of sinfulness, that is what the literal celebration is. So what you have is Fat Monday. Now, why does that mean anything? 
Well, what they did is they would take all their meat, all the things that they were going to have to give up for 40 days, and the church said, you have to eat it all or get rid of it before Ash Wednesday because you can't have any pleasure. And meat was the most pleasurable thing because it was hard to acquire. Meat was really expensive. So on Monday before Ash Wednesday, every family would cook all, and, and back then you didn't keep steaks. They would go bad. So you cook them all. If you had a, a big piece of meat, you had to cook it. You had to dry it. You made like a jerky or something like that. You had a salt pork, things like that. Most of the meat that you kept that you could keep that was still raw that you had to cook was bacon. So they would eat pounds and pounds of bacon. Now, as a Baptist fat boy, that, I mean, like, I was, it's like, yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, I can get into that, you know, and that's what it is. I mean, that's really, that's what it was. And so they would do that. Now, what are they saying? Hey, let's eat everything that we are going to give up to focus on Christ. Let's take advantage of that and do as much as we can before we decide we're going to focus on Christ. Okay, problem. Second thing is, as you come to Tuesday, which is Mardi Gras, right the day before Ash Wednesday. So now all your rich food has to go away. Rich food is butter. I love me some butter. That would be included. <laughs> but you have butter, sugar, honey, certain types of spices, Fats that you would cook with it, it, like bacon grease and things like that. Those are things. So what they do? They just toss them out? No. We had to make things to eat because we're celebrating again. This is what we get to enjoy before we have to give up some things to focus on Christ. You see, the attitude would be kind of counterproductive. Why am I not just focusing on Christ in this? Now, the issue comes like, am I being made righteous by what I am doing? That's always a question. Remember, we are not made righteous but except through one thing, the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We cannot do anything that brings us closer to God. Now, we can give up things in order to focus on God. But I will tell you this, if you truly fast from social media and you realize the amount of time that you spend on it and you spend that time in the Word, you won't go back to social media. You'll stay with the Word. If you spend time in prayer that you, and you give up TV time, you'll find out, man, that time with the Lord is so important. I am no longer going to go back to that. I'm going to stay. It's not this conditional 40-day period. So that's one of the reasons why we don't do that. Now, when they came to this, now some of y'all will remember some of this history. Many of y'all, how many of y'all remember uh, a Fat Tuesday or a, or a Monday Tuesday or Mardi Gras pancake dinner? Any of y'all remember that? Oh, they used to be all over the place. You go into Louisiana, they bake pancakes. Why? It takes your sugar, it takes your butter, and it takes your honey. And you make all these pancakes up to the church. So the church was saying, hey, we're going to all dive into this before we can't have it for 40 days. Doesn't make much sense, but that's what they did. So whenever you see when people go, well, it's traditionally we have to have pancakes before Ash Wednesday, that's where that came from. Some people have no clue why they want Brenner on that day. They don't know why they want breakfast for dinner. That's what Brenner is. If you're wondering what Brenner is, that's what it is. I didn't just say it weird. Brenner is breakfast for dinner, okay? And so it is. Is it not? Brenner is that, isn't it? There you go, right there. She's with me, all right? So how many of y'all like breakfast for dinner? Oh, I do right here. You cook sausage and bacon and you put biscuits on the plate? I'm good. It's all good. So, and Danny Phillips has a problem. He does not like Waffle House. And I was like, how do you not? It's, I, that's what I said. I'm like, it's just Waffle House. And I, you can see everything they cook right in front of you. That's a good thing. Anyways, so we, uh, so we always wonder why these things happen. Now, just an interesting detail, and I actually got this from a pastor friend who he was talking about Lent to his congregation. He said, hey, you, it, this is a true story. The McDonald's was suffering such a huge uh, loss on Fridays during the Lenten season during the 1960s because so many people gave up red meat on Fridays. That's why fish became there. The fish filet sandwich was made in Ohio to counter that, and now it's one of the best-selling products, but it all came from the Lenten season, okay? So, it, so that's where that came from. And uh, so if, if, you wanna, if you like the fish filet, you need to thank the people who gave up meat back in the 60s, and now they have that. So... Should we practice Lent? The answer to that question is really about 
Why are you giving up time and what do you think it is achieving for you? Do I think that we should walk around with something on our heads? Actually, I think how we live and how we speak and actually how we share the gospel should be enough evidence of who we're focused on. And it should be all year long. Now, the ash on the head is a sign of brokenness and repentance. Now, I have a friend who was not just what I would call nominal Catholic. We all know nominal Catholics. There are people who say, I am a Catholic, but they only go whenever they've done something really wrong in their eyes and they go to repent or they have to go for some type of mass, whether it be somebody passed away, a wedding, but they do not attend on a weekly basis ever. That's nominal. Now, my friend was a Catholic. They went to church. In fact, they went to pray with some of the nuns in the morning. And that was uh, at hospitals. I mean, they went every morning early to pray with nuns at the Catholic hospitals. They were at mass every week. So they were Catholic, okay? And we started talking about why do we have a brokenness over sin for a certain amount of time instead of brokenness over our sin all the time? And they said, well, it's when we really focus on it. And so we began to talk about that. And one of the explanations was, is, well, I give up these things because it reminds me that I am broken and I need to show myself broken before the Lord. Well, giving up chocolate or giving up a piece of meat does not show brokenness of your sin before the Lord. What shows brokenness of your sin before the Lord is that you live a repentant life of holiness before him. It's that when you know you are living in a sinful practice or in a sinful attitude that you bow to the king of kings and at the cross and you change your way and repentance is something you do all the time. So is it right to practice Lent? It's not necessarily wrong, but I think that if we just harbor in, they said, you know, we do this because for 40 days we want to focus on Christ. My challenge with that to be is, my challenge to that would be, why are we not focusing on Christ 365 days a year and on a leap year 366? That's what we should be doing. And so that's what it is. And the ashes were back from the Old Testament where they would tear their clothes, put on sackcloth, and it was a sign of sorrow, and they would throw ash up in the air, and it would fall all over them. It was a sign that they were trying to turn from their sin. My Catholic friend, I said, what are you going to pick back up after the 40 days? And they said, everything. I gave it up for the time I'm supposed to. I said, then you haven't repented of anything. It's just a picture. And pictures don't do anything, just like baptism doesn't save you. It's just a picture. The Holy Spirit makes the change. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. And the believer lives in brokenness based on the conviction of sin that only the Holy Spirit can bring. Okay? So that's the Lent lesson. All right? So if you've never heard about Lent, that is Lent. And you can check out all that stuff. It's completely true, I promise you. So... Moving into tonight's lesson, why making decisions, I mean, making decisions versus making disciples, why raised hands and sinners' uh, prayers don't necessarily indicate salvation. Now, this uh, quote by Charles Spurgeon says this, many a good man in his own esteem has been a very devil in God's eyes. Many a pious soul in his esteem of the church, in the esteem of the church has been nothing but rottenness in the esteem of God. This is a quote stating, that we have people who put themselves up because they say, well, I did not do this. And people say, well, I am okay because of. However, they didn't have any actual lifestyle. They didn't have any actual, what James says, fruit. This is one of the biggest things the church struggles with. And a lot of this book is focused on, if you haven't noticed, Most of these things are talking about when someone says they're a believer, yet they have no desire to follow Christ, and they have no fruitfulness in their life. Jesus said it this way, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit, and a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. For a bad tree bears spoiled or rotten fruit, and a good tree provides good fruit. And so whenever we see the actions of ourself, am I bearing the fruit of the cross? Am I bearing the fruit of righteousness that only comes through Jesus? 
Or is my fruit rotten? Am I a gossiper? Am I a thief? And a thief doesn't have to be somebody just takes something physical. You may steal somebody's joy on purpose. And I want to tell you something, that's theft. And we got to be careful. You know, and, and this is just a, a thing. We, we have kids. You know when your kid says something that they know it's going to get your goat? I, I don't like that statement. Somebody always just tell me, if you don't somebody get your goat, don't tell them where you tied it up. I'm like, whatever. It's like, <laughs> stop it with your animal husbandry, like, logic. Like, but the truth is, it's like your kid will come at you with something that hurts. Why? Because they know it's going to get you. Man, it's sad whenever b- adults do that. Is my attitude one of lying or is it one of look at me or is it even one of self-pity? Those are things that are not good fruit. And so it's not just about them, it's about us. And we have to remember that when someone actually comes to Jesus, they are given the Holy Spirit that now is going to lead them in directions and we should begin to see fruit. Now, fruit may not be, remember, a tree doesn't just get planted in the next day. It's not a fully grown tree that produces its fruit. It may take a little bit for the tree, but I'll tell you, whenever new leaves come on a tree in the spring, you go, oh man, it's okay, it's not dead. And sometimes we have to watch a believer grow and start seeing some twigs start to come out and some, some leaves start to come out. Man, there wasn't much fruit this year. Hey, next year. So Rhonda and I, when we bought this house, has two pecan trees in the front, okay? They're small. They were planted, I don't know, maybe a year or two before we got there. And they've never been fed. I'm a terrible, I'm a terrible person. I don't feed my trees. They could probably be twice their size right now, but I don't spend that time. And so, but they're small. Well, if you don't remember, we had like snowpocalypse. Well, it actually wasn't snowpocalypse. It wasn't even icepocalypse. It was just cold. Like last year about this time when we had a week's worth of freezing temperature. Now, I'll tell you, we looked at those trees for a long time in the spring because we're like, they're only this big around. There's one on one side, one on the other. But when that first twig came out, I mean, that first leaf came out, I was like, yes, we didn't lose those trees because I don't want to replace those. And Rhonda was like, I'm going to get some pecan trees. I was like, okay. So we're going to have these pecan trees. Now, that year, one of the pecan trees had two pecans. But that's two pecans more than what was there the year before. (laughs) That is growth. And you know what? You may be thinking, I have not really seen, man, God's work in my life other than I know where I'm supposed to be going. I want to tell you something. When you start to bear fruit, when you say, you know what? I I got saved and I know I'm supposed to be at church. I'm not perfect, but I'm going three times a month instead of what I used to when I was just at Christmas and Easter or when I was just this. I want to know more about the Bible. I want to tell you something. That's growth. When you say, I'd rather hang out with this group of people that's a family, a body of Christ, than go do what I used to do. That's growth. And the best way to fertilize your heart is what we're going to talk about a little bit, and it's diving into God's Word. It's reading the Bible, period. So what we have now is this culture that believes, man, I made a decision, and I raised my hand, and I said the sinner's prayer. And he uses an all too in the book, if you have it, you read it, he uses an all too familiar example of what happens. And I have been at this place at this exact moment. I think probably all of us have been. So Rhonda and I were serving a particular church. I'm not going to say which one because y'all could look it up. I'm not going to tell you location. But it was a great VBS. Everything was good. And we had a time of invitation after the gospel was shared and some kids raised their hands and so they said break up and go to that and when it got done the pastor walked up and said you know what I want to ask that question again because I don't believe enough kids heard what was being said and the statement that was made was do you want to go to heaven when you die I can ask this room hey do you want to go to heaven okay let's do this Who wants to go to heaven when they die? (laughs) All right, all y'all are saved. No, that is correct. There was not one mention that you were separated from God, and it's your fault. There was not one mention that God knew that you had no chance and that he was going to destroy you because of your sinfulness. There was no mention that he loves us enough that while we were in that state, that he sent Jesus. There was no mention of the name of Jesus. You hear what I said? Do you want to go to heaven? Where's Jesus in that? 
There's not. That's just me getting a good place. That's me having the sweet in the sky and not the dungeon in the, it down under. But we, we have to remember that salvation rests on us knowing we are sinners and that Jesus died for us. And so they did that. And a ton of kids raised their hand and they prayed. Now, thankfully, when we followed up, because we did follow up with every kid that signed a card, we were able to weed out. Because the last thing we want to do is give anybody a false assurance of what's there. Now, I will tell you, there are some of those kids who truly made a decision that day, not based on that, fir- that last statement, but on that first gospel presentation. And they have followed Jesus, will follow Jesus, will stumble, but will get back up. But we did not want to see. I remember a guy, his name was Larry. I can give you that much. And he went through those cards crying, saying, I don't know how many of these we could be giving a false hope. And we had to weed through all those cards. So what does it actually mean to come to Jesus? It's exactly what I just said, that God's holiness is offended by our sin. So he sent Jesus And the saving work of Jesus on the cross leads every person to a personal decision. You have to make the decision to understand that you are separated from God and you are a sinner. And that his wrath will one day rest on you. But he gave you a savior. And he said, I will send my son and he will die in your place so you can take his place. And that's what happened. But Jesus didn't just take your punishment. He also defeated the one thing none of us can. He defeated death. So he took our punishment and he defeated death. And because of that, it's not only did he take our place, we become brothers and sisters with Christ, co-heirs with Christ, as Scripture tells us. And we are part of the kingdom of God if you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, which means he did die for you and he conquered death for you. And that you confess him as Lord, which means he gets everything. He's not just your ticket agent to heaven. He is the master of your life. And that's what we have to remember. That's what it means to actually come to Jesus. And as we uh, keep, well, I'm hoping this is going to turn. We'll see. We'll see if it goes. Hey, Rhonda, click the next one, please. There you go. Go to the next one. Why would someone want to manipulate? So this is what we always ask. Why would somebody want to manipulate someone into following Christ? Well, I don't think they want to manipulate. I don't think that's what their mind is. But what we have is two reasons, and I think we just need to point them out. The first one is theological pragmatism. Now, what does that mean? You go, what in the world is pragmatism? (laughs) Like, why are we using these words? Well, pragmatism is the idea that I can get loose with some things to achieve the goal that I want. That's what pragmatism is in layman's terms. So you can have theological pragmatism, you can have social pragmatism, you can have economic pragmatism. It's that I can get loose on the truths if I get the outcome that I want. Does that make sense? So the the ends justify the means. All right? Now, I will tell you when it comes to Jesus, the means will always give you the end. When we share the gospel and we're faithful, we'll see what God's going to do. If we try to manipulate it, we will see what we just created. So we need to make sure that we're not part of that. The other part is accolades. Hey, did you hear about our VBS? We had 35 kids come to the Lord. We had 55 kids come to the Lord. We had 105 kids come to the Lord. So here's my question. I always ask people, and, and I had to ask myself this question, too. How many of those kids came back to church the next week because they understood what they needed? How many of those people, whether it's at a revival or whether it's at a, at a men's supper or whatever, how many of them are actively seeking Christ two weeks after they got their ticket to heaven? Because that's a differ- there's a difference there. And so a lot of times people are just like, well, it gets numbers, 
Most of evangelism today is obsessed with getting someone to make a decision. However, the apostles were obsessed with making disciples. And that is what we have to be about. If we just want to mark a decision on paper, we are not a church. We're not building a church. But if we're interested in making disciples, people's, people whose lives look like Christ and hopefully looks like ours, because as Paul said, follow me as I what? Follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. So what is he saying? As I look like Christ, I want you to look like Christ. He wasn't saying look like me, like Christ me, you. He wasn't a middleman. He was saying follow me as I follow Christ. So that means as long as I'm following Christ, you're going to look more like Christ. And that's what discipling is. Now, I've told y'all, I don't like the word discipling. We make that up. It's really learning to live under the discipline of Christ. What he calls us to do. What is discipline? It's being self-controlled. It's knowing this is what I'm called to, and I will hold to it no matter what. So, a gospel presentation that makes heaven the point of the decision is a cultural Christian gospel. One might not even realize that they are presenting. So whenever we say, hey, do you want to go to heaven? We may not realize that we're presenting something that's never going to lead to salvation, but we are. Instead of asking, do you want to go to heaven? We need to say, hey, do you want to know about a God that loves you? Do you want to know about a Jesus who loves you? Do you want to know about a Jesus who knows who you are? Do you want to know about a God who loves you in spite of? Those are the questions. And even a child. And get that because a child can hear you want to know about a God who loves you enough that he wants to be with you and you with him that's the gospel heaven's just a great byproduct of the gospel so we have to remember that we have to be good at sharing the gospel gospel presentations must point people to God's holiness the consequences of sins. God's holiness is offended by our sin, but the saving work of Jesus, the forgiveness needed, and the reconciliation that is only possible for those who believe the gospel by faith. So listen, just again tonight, I'm just going to tell you, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are separated from God by your sin. You can't be baptized into it. You can't take the right church. You can't go and confess enough. You can't. There's not anything you can do. The only thing that you can do is put your faith in Jesus that he died in the on the cross in your place and that now you want to live for him and you believe he did those things, that he did that and that you can live for him. And the Bible says that you will be saved, but it's a recognition that you are separated from him. So as we jump into the scripture tonight, let's stand together as we read from God's words. We read from Luke uh, chapter 14. Say it with me if you know it. We stand in honor of God's word because it is his holy, infallible, inerrant word. It is completely true and trustworthy. It is necessary for the unbeliever to find salvation through Jesus Christ and for the believer to live a life of godliness. The Bible is the word of God. Church, do you believe that? Amen. And this is what the word of God says. Now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower or a structure, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, the man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, if any one of you who does not renounce all that he has, he cannot 
be my disciple. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that tonight that you would again show us who we are, show us who you are. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would move in our lives and that you would fill us up as we want to be sponges for your word, to soak it up. And as we get squeezed this week by pressures of this world, by our own flesh, by the temptations, and Father, then just by the normal trials of this life, that when we get squeezed and wrung out, that it would be your spirit and the word that would flow out of us. So, Father, bend and break us so you can mold, mend, and make us more like Jesus. We pray these things in your Holy Son's name. Amen. So it's a serious topic that we're in, but I want you to notice a couple of things about this text. He says three times that this one cannot be my disciple. In that text we just read, Jesus said, if you don't do this, you can't be my disciple. If you don't do this, you can't be my disciple. If you don't do this, you can't be my disciple. So the first one, a lot of people get really hung up on because he said, if you don't hate your mother and your father, your brothers and your sisters, your children and your spouse, you can't be my disciple. Now, a lot of people go, well, wait. Doesn't the Bible teach us that husband is supposed to love the wife? Wife is supposed to love the husband? Aren't we supposed to love our children? And God even tells us that he is like a good father and like even a mothering hen. God has the attributes that he wants to cover his children and protect them. Isn't that all? So how does that work? What the text is pointing us to is that anything that would stand in the way of us serving God, if a parent could say, you really don't need that, or your spouse can say you really don't need that. Or you give up true conviction for the gospel because your kids want you to walk a certain way because they say you're traditional and have an old thought process. And so you just need to go this way. Mom and dad, that's not really that important. And you'll bend for that. He's saying, hey, that's not a true disciple. So how many of y'all have ever read Pilgrim's Progress? Okay, I'm just going to tell you, I think I brought that up before. If you've never read Pilgrim's Progress... You need to read it, okay? It's a great book. It's written by, I always want to say Paul Bunyan, but that's not him. Paul Bunyan was a make-believe lumberjack with a big blue ox. What's the ox's name? Was the, what? Yep, that was the ox's name? Man, y'all are way out in front of me. Y'all are like, I ain't even got that out yet. You're like, babe. <laughs> but John Bunyan, who was put in prison for preaching God's word, wrote a story about a young man who lives in the city of destruction. And he hears the truth about a celestial city and about one who can get the burden off his back. And when you read the story, it's much better than watching any of the movies, but there are some good theatrical uh, movies and, and uh, cartoons. It's, it's easier for them to do a cartoon because it has a lot of uh, imagery in it. But he describes the weight on his back like a big pack that's weighing him down. When he gets to the cross, it falls off. And that's the weight of sin being let go. So there's a lot of imagery. It's a great read. And, um, and so, but when he first leaves, if you read the whole story and don't just watch a movie, it talks about how his wife and his kids call him foolish for chasing after Christ. And he weeps and he cries and he weeps and he cries as he walks away from the city of destruction to go find truth, knowing he's leaving his children behind. And later on in the movie, there's a point where he meets the gatekeeper and he goes and finds salvation, which is Jesus. And he's talking to some of the fruit of the Spirit, which are portrayed as people. And they say, we can tell you, carry your family with you. And he says, I pray every day that they'll turn to seek the truth or that I will find peace if they choose not to. It's a very hard statement. Now, I'll tell you, Pilgrim's Progress is not the Bible, but it may be something you want to read. But that's what that text means. Nothing can hold you back from following Christ if you're a true disciple. So how do we help in these efforts because he says, hey, you can't be my disciple. And he says, who does not count the cost of building a house before they build it? Because then you're going to start building it and you won't finish it. And people are going to go, well, they just didn't have enough money. They weren't really committed to that. And so he says, who doesn't count the cost? Well, the church's job 
is to let people know salvation in Jesus is going to cost you your life. It has to be part of the gospel presentation. It has to be part of what we say about Jesus. That if you want to follow Christ, if you truly believe that Jesus died for your sin and that he offers a covering and God will forgive you because of Jesus' sacrifice for you. If we truly believe that and you truly believe that, you also need to know from the moment you say, God, I believe that and I want you as my Lord, you have to understand it's going to cost you everything. Nothing is yours anymore. No matter how hard you sit, felt like you worked for it, no matter if they're your children, no matter if it's your home, it's not yours. It's his. Your desires have to be changed. That's why the psalmist would say, Lord, I want to have your desire. Delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. So what is that saying? It's not, hey, I want a car, so I'm going to focus on the Bible, and then he's going to give me a car. What it's saying is when I focus on God's word, my heart's going to start being like God's heart, and then as it beats God's heart, I'm going to see that stuff come to fruition in my life. And I'm going to see more peace in my life. I'm going to see more faithfulness in my life. and see more truth in my life. I'm going to see more righteousness in my life. I'm going to see more of sacrifice in my life. Because Jesus gave everything, and we're called to be like Jesus. So how do we help with this? We're not only saved by sin, we all, but also to a lifetime commitment to Christ within a body of believers. So what does that mean? We, we need to tell them, listen, being part of a church is a big part of following Christ because it gives you someone to walk with, to live life with. And whenever we have people make decisions and they just walk out of church never to be seen again, they didn't understand what to be part of the body of Christ is. Because as you live life as a Christian on your own, you're going to get chewed up and spit out. We all do. Many of you, every week, something goes on in your life that because you won't let go of what Christ has taught or what the Bible tells you. Somebody says something, does something, a kid won't see you, a grandkid doesn't want to be a part of your life, whatever it may be. You may not have taken a job that would physically, fiscally provide a better life for your family because you knew that it would cost you Sundays and you didn't want to leave the church family because you know that's where strength comes in numbers. And what happens? We get beat up. We get bruised. Sometimes we get beat up and bruised by bad decisions we make. And we repent and we're broken. And we come back to church crawling back. And we get back with our family and we say, man, it's so good to see you. How can I encourage you and how can you encourage me? Because we got to go back out tomorrow and we got to be Jesus all over again. We got to show him. We got to talk about him. So, what's some practical ways? I mean, what's some things that we can do that will help people? Well, the first one I already told you about it's the number one indicator of spiritual growth in a new believer is regular Bible reading. So much that a study done by Lifeway in 2008 said this those who engage in regular Bible reading are more likely to first confess wrongdoings to God and ask for forgiveness. When you read your Bible, it leads you to repentance. Is anybody okay with that? We should be. Every morning when we read the Word of God, it should point out something that God's saying, you can be more like Jesus in this. You could follow me closer in this. God, I want that. Cleanse me of my unrighteousness and fill me with your righteousness. That's what we should be asking. Choose to obey and follow God, even if at a great cost. So those who read their Bible regularly will obey and follow God, even if at, at a great cost. They choose it because it's implanted into their life. They pray for the spiritual state of unbelievers. People who read their Bible pray for the lost more than people who don't read their Bible. Why? Because the Bible ultimately reminds us that we're on that same path until Jesus found us. That's what it does. It reminds us every day. Man, you were broken, you were lost, you were out on your own, but Jesus saved you. And it automatically goes to, man, my neighbor, 
man, my child, man, my boss, my co-teacher, whatever it may be, they're in that same predicament. They'll read a book about increasing their spiritual growth. They'll pick up something that will take Scripture and help them understand Scripture and how God wants to lead them in their life. So just by reading the Bible, these are things that people are more likely to do. And finally, they are more likely to be discipled by a more spiritually mature person. Now, I thought this was very interesting because this was not, the word spiritually is key because many times when someone comes to know the Lord, they think, well, I need to be disciple. I need to have a mentor. They think somebody's always older than them. It's not always the case. I'll tell you this. I got some guys that pastors younger than me, man, they teach me a lot. They give me a lot of encouragement. And so whenever you think about, man, do I have somebody pouring into me? It's not about if they've been in church longer. It's about, are they more spiritually mature? Do you see marks of Jesus on them that you don't see in other people? That's what you want in a mentor. So just by reading the Bible, these five things were very evident in that 2008 study that people would confess wrongdoings before God choose to obey him even if it costs them. They would pray for unbelievers. They would read a book. So what do we need to encourage young believers to do first? Read the word. Get into the Bible. If you do not read your Bible, you are missing out on God's love letter to you. Do not miss out. Ed Stetzer said it this way, Bible engagement points people toward maturity, and maturing Christians have practices that correspond to Bible reading. So when you read the Bible, you'll start doing what it says. And when you do that, you're going to look like what the Bible says you should look like. It's that simple. We always go, oh, no, it's, it's simple. If you want to be an Astros fan, what do you do? You go buy an Astros shirt, an Astros hat. If you don't want to pay the money for the logo, you go buy a yellow and orange and blue shirt and you wear it. But you still figure out how to identify, you show what it is. It's not hard. If you read the Bible, it's going to change your life. And the more it changes your life, the more you're going to look like what you're supposed to according to the Bible. So what are some other ways that we can encourage people? Well, Bible reading is the most important but giving people a place to serve in a church that they can get beside other believers. And we always think of service as, well, I don't teach. I, don't, I want to be in the nursery, and I don't want to shake hands at the door. Man, there's a lot of things you can do at the church. You can say, hey, will you spend 10 minutes with me every Sunday morning walk in the parking lot or walk in the parking lot while people are getting here, just making sure people are able to get in, that we have no riffraff showing up, you know, hanging out, scaring people. We don't really have that out here. You may have to chase a stray dog every once in a while. But, hey, will you just walk with me? Guess what happens when you're walking around that parking lot and you're greeting people and saying, hey, we're so glad you're here this morning? Eventually, you're going to say things like this. Hey, we're so glad you're here this morning. I hope Jesus speaks to you this morning. I hope you leave this place changed today. And why? Because as you're talking to that other believer, God begins to work. Man, I almost, never mind, I'm not going to say that. That would probably not be polite. I'll say Nancy Pelosi did this last night and I almost did that and I was like I'm not doing that <laughs> Woo! I'm not gonna do that um I was like they're just gonna do that and I was like oh whoa that's what no I'm not gonna do that um but when you're walking side by side I'll do this what you're doing is you're bumping up against another believer and the Bible says as iron sharpens iron so does one man sharpen another there's a thousand things that people can do up here at the church. But what the important part is, is that we're getting together to speak about the truth of the cross and what God has done for us and remind ourselves that this is what we're supposed to do. So serving is a big part of it. So thought questions for tonight. What ways is our church pointing people to, the, to a life of following Christ instead of a rite of passage? And... Or is it vice versa? How are we making sure that whenever we share the gospel, it's true? Well, I'll tell you just, you need to think through that because each one of you should be sharing the gospel and you're part of our church. So you are a big part of that statement. How am I pointing people to a life of Christ and not just a decision? Now, in our 
church now, if someone wants to accept Christ, one, we have a real conversation with them, whether it's a 10-minute conversation, five-minute conversation, we want to have a discussion with them. We want them to know. Then we also are trying to build ways that we connect our small group leaders and some of our care ministries to those people so they automatically have people reaching out to them. We just talked with our baptism. If you're on our baptism team and you're in here, raise your hand. Is anybody in here that's on our baptism team? Nobody? Okay, good. I'm glad they all showed up tonight. We just had our baptism meeting tonight. Uh, I mean, on Sunday. And uh, whenever we had it, we were talking about what they can do to encourage people as they are getting baptized. That's the first step of obedience for a believer, that you make a disciple, they become a disciple, and then they are baptized. That's what the Bible teaches. And so we talk to them about what that looks like for them. And so when you're standing up there in the baptistry with them, they're going to be nervous. It's just what it is. They're going to be nervous. Some people are going to be shaken. Some people are, like, so excited. I mean, if y'all saw Rhonda weed this past Sunday up there, it was amazing. It was amazing watching Rhonda up there. And then we had, is it Carson or is it the other brother? It was Cason that got baptized, right? It's Cason and Carson. I'm sorry. I'm trying. Um, but, uh, but he was up there, and it was amazing. Listen to that. And I said, hey, when you're up there, ask him, hey, what has Jesus done in your life? Get them to think about that. Get them to talk about it. Why? Being part of the baptism team, you're handing them a towel. You're making sure that they have the clothes they need and that they're going to get what they need and that you tell them, hey, we got hair gel and a hair dryer in here and it's okay. It's all good. You think that's real tangible. No, it is all spiritual. It's that you come beside them and you say, I am so excited Jesus saved you because it reminds me that Jesus saved me. And we can never get over that. That's what should be driving us out to talk to other people. So we want to talk about that. So when you think about that, know that we want to have those discussions too. When we have kids come forward, we, and I'm just going to let you know, if you have a kid and they're small, we're going to ask to meet with them without the parent in the room. Because parents have a real bad tendency of doing something. Y'all know what that is? Oh, yeah. Hey, you know the answer. Just tell them the answer. You know about Jesus on the cross for you. Did he stay dead? Remember the Easter egg? Boop, he came out? No, I mean, that's what they do. And then they go, but why do y'all? Because we don't want false conversions in a kid thinking, well, I'm okay. And while there, my mom was saved at five years old and never looked back. My brother was saved at six, never looked back. There are people who get saved and they understand Jesus died for me and he took my place. Now, they're going to understand the cost of life is much more, and it gets greater and greater as you get older. They're going to get develop that. But we also don't want some kid just saying, hey, yeah, but I did that prayer. I said that thing. I'm on a piece of paper. Because my book, our book, that sits in that office, which now is digitized and it's in a computer and somewhere on the cloud. Rhonda, I'll explain that to you later. She's always going, where's the cloud? <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> That's where the book is. That book means nothing. There's only one book that means anything when it comes to believing in Jesus. That's the book of life. And there's only one person that writes names in that book because it's his book. That's why the Bible says it's the Lamb's book of life. And while we don't know what the ink is, I always like to think that he writes it in his own blood. That's one of mine. They have my blood. So we want to meet with kids. And so if you have a kid and we ask you to do that, don't take that offensively. We want to make sure coming alongside of you as the primary discipler of your kids or your grandkids that you know and we know that that child has an understanding that Christ died for them, that they were separated from God, and that through Jesus they will be saved. And then we just got to disciple them as they walk through life and go, man, that's costed me a lot. Yep, it is. Timothy was 16 when he was pastor in a church, and he wrote a lot of questions to Peter, I mean to Paul, and Paul's answering them. And a lot of the times he's saying, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. It's making your stomach upset. I mean, Timothy was going through all the markers of stress. It's going to cost you a lot. And Paul just discipled him through it. 
How can you or the ministry with which you're involved foster a culture that promotes true gospel understanding? So in here we have some Sunday school teachers. We have deacons. We have people who serve in our kitchen. We have people who work with our children. How can you foster the true gospel in all of those places? One of the things that I love about Houston is that there's this really cool place. If you've never been there, it's open to the public. You can go see it. It's almost a museum. It's called Lanier Theological Library. Anybody have ever heard of Lanier? Nobody? Okay. Lanier Theological Library, Mark Lanier, who's one of the most, uh, uh, he's, the, he's probably the best trial lawyer in the United States. Uh, he, he's doing trials against like Pfizer and people like that. He's not like playing small ball, you know. Great man of God, goes to champion fours. Well, whenever his father died, and he does, he has, he has, he's a very wealthy individual, but he loves the Lord. When his father died, he was like, man, we're from Lubbock, but we don't want to, or Midland, I think it was, actually. Those are two different places. And he said, we don't want to bury him up there because nobody can go up there. Our whole family's here, so we want to bury him. But we don't want to just bury him somewhere in Houston because they're just these huge cemeteries. So he's an attorney, so he got to work, and in 24 hours, he had a quarter acre of his property over there in, in um, uh, Champion Forest designated as a family cemetery. I was like, that must be nice. So he got that, and they, they buried his dad. Very interesting story. They had to go get grandma, his mom, and they got her and brought her and buried her next to him because <laughs> they're like, we can't leave mom away from dad. So they went and picked her up and brought her. So it's very interesting. But whenever he got done with that, he said, I want to build a chapel that we can go when the family comes on our property so they can pray. So he wound up building this chapel, and it's a, five, it's a, it's a copy of a 500, uh, 80, 500, a 5th century or 6th century Byzantine chapel. That's what it is. And it's stone. It has the painted ceilings that tell the story of Christ or of the Bible. It starts at creation, the fall, everything. It's the, it's the, it's the story. It's incredible. One day, maybe we should just do like a church like, we'll just go over there. Y'all good with that? Okay, I'll set that up, okay? I'll set that up. And so when you walk in, though, what's cool about it, and we learn about this stuff um, in Bible college and stuff like that, but if you ever look at a cathedral or a chapel that was built at that time era, people couldn't read. So after the Roman Empire fell, literacy dropped, and only 3% of the population of the world's population could read. But before the Roman Empire fall, about 80% of the known population could read. That's how the, the Roman Empire was a great place. And so when it fell, though, it did that. So by 500 AD, it had already fallen and people couldn't read. So they had to figure out how to teach people the truths of Christ by the construction of their chapel. So when you look down on it, it is the, it's in the shape of a cross. So it's a long building and then up about three quarters of the way, it has two wings. And so it's the shape of the cross to teach that Jesus, the rock that was always used was very hard rock, whatever hardest rock they could, because the foundation looked like a cross and the foundation of our faith is Jesus. And they always put a dome right above the very center where the two places would meet because they believe that that's the closest point to God at that point. And that right at that place, if Jesus was spread on the cross, his heart would be right at the center. So the closest place to God was, is, was God's heart. And the closest humanity has ever been to God is when Jesus died on the cross for us. Because that's when his love was expressed the most for us. And so if you go through the whole thing, there's three windows in the back. Yeah, I guess you can imagine what they represent, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And then they had all sorts of things. I mean, even the paintings of the robes that Jesus has on, stuff like that, all taught things. The point is, is that they used everything to show something about the gospel. We should be thinking, not that we have to build a building like that, but how do I constantly point people to Jesus? What reminds them of Jesus? A word, hope on a painting from Hobby Lobby, is not going to point them to Jesus. But telling them, hey, do you have hope? Coming out of your mouth and starting that conversation will point them to Jesus. We have to be about the business of pointing people to Jesus with everything that we have. So we don't just have decision makers, we have disciples being made. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we would just continue uh, to walk in truth. And Father, as your word taught us tonight, that we cannot be your disciples if we're not willing to count the cost, if we're not willing to abandon everything else 
And if we're not willing to even pick up painful things, as the Bible says, would take up their cross and follow me. Father, I pray that we would leave everything behind and with reckless abandon, we would pursue and chase you. Holy Spirit, fill us so as we are wrung out this week, that we would pour you out. We pray these things in your Holy Son's name, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. All right. If y'all would cancel the live stream. It's a couple of things before we go. Of course, if we can take the four.